Welcome back to another edition of the Penn State 365 podcast. I'm your host, Richie Schneiderite. And we got a special guest today, uh, Board of Trustee member uh, Jay Paterno. Jay, how's Doing it going? Great. How about you? I can't complain. Uh, spring ball is right around the corner, and uh, I guess it's here. But spring uh, spring games right around the corner. So excited and for that. The weather looks like you know it's day college. You never I know, count knock, on knock on wood. It looks like it's going to be a <laughs> phenomenal weekend weather wise. So anybody yeah, who's not course. making planes to come up, make planes to come up and see this thing. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so let's, let's jump right into it. Uh, the biggest thing, the biggest discussion thing that everyone's talking about on the message boards and Twitter, social media is NIL. Just give me your overall thoughts on NIL currently. Well, I think let, let me, let me just start with an overview of NIL and where it is with collectives. Cause there's been a lot of discussion about collectives, okay. what they do, what they don't do. Generally mm -hmm. what you're seeing, and just keep in mind, I've been consulting nationally on NIL for over three years. So I know what's mm -hmm. going on at a lot of schools from coast to coast talk to people at a lot of schools coast to coast. So I know a, a good sense as to what's out there and what the market is. But what people are seeing, they're saying, oh, this guy's making $4 million and that guy's making $4 million. This guy's making $3 million. Well, what the collectives have essentially settled into uh, as a business model is a group licensing uh, effort. Now, just, just so everybody understands, you know, this, I'm not speaking on behalf of Successful Honor. I helped found it. I'm not, I'm not involved in the day to day and I've done things media wise to try and educate people on these issues. So what's really settled into the collective model is a group licensing with a team. For example, Success with Honor has contracts with every scholarship football player on the team right now. So they've done mm -hmm. what was asked. Okay. So that's what you're getting. Those, it's kind of almost like a base model. Now, when you see the $2 million deal, a guy like Bryce Young at Alabama, those are being negotiated by agents, not really by collectives, by and large, because the agents are the ones that are going out and, and, and getting the deals. And everybody had this idea before NL started that, oh, well, this guy will be able to get a $3 million deal with, with Nike, and this guy will get a deal with Gatorade, and this guy will get a deal with Coca-Cola. And when you really look at it, mm -hmm. they overestimated the market. Because just take a look at the NFL. How many NFL – now, that's the NFL. Now, we're talking serious league. How many NFL guys yeah. have national deals? You can count them on two hands. And, you know, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning have more deals probably than anybody. They're not even playing anymore. So the big national deals, when you look at a sport that is as regional as college football – are going to be hard to come by. Bryce Young certainly got it with the Dr. Pepper ad in the Heisman House, but he was the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, as you'd expect. Now, a guy like Drew Allar. Drew Allar is represented by CAA out in California. He's got two agents. And certainly the big deals that are going to come his way will probably come after he has the kind of success we all know he's going to have this fall. And, and they'll be negotiated by them, not by a group licensing thing in, in collective. So that's kind of the general... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the marketplace for it. Okay. Now, um, in regards to success with honor, how is it, is there a plan in place to make it more competitive or with, I know obviously it's, it's really tough in today's day and age with pay for play kind of almost right. a thing at this point with some schools. Um, is there a plan in place to make it more competitive and does that start with success with honor or is that more start with the agents when you were mentioning? Before? Well, in terms of the base package, the, the general base marketing group and knowing what some mm -hmm. SC schools, you know, again, I can't disclose necessarily what other schools are doing because there is some confidentiality involved there as to some conversations and feedback I've gotten and people I've talked to. But I can tell you, mm -hmm. when you look at what our guys are getting on average, and again, I can't tell you what they're getting because, again, there's confidentiality in these contracts. Mm -hmm. We are right in the marketplace with some very, very prominent SEC schools, contrary to what people have said and what people have written or made statements. I know mm -hmm. one of the things that people ask about is Shrewsbury, you know, uh, Mike Shrewsbury, before he left, said that, you know, we were 14th in the Big Ten in NIL. There's no way for him to know that because these numbers mm -hmm. aren't disclosed publicly. Every one of his scholarship players was on a contract before last season because he was trying to keep, mm -hmm. you know, to help keep some guys here and give them some money. And so, you know, the things that they asked for were all met. At the end of the day, Michael Shrewsbury made a decision to leave because he wanted to go home. And he made that very clear. And any other speculation uh, is just, you know, it's people trying to stir some things up when there really isn't anything there. 
Yeah. So obviously there's a couple of rumors out there. Um, so we were just shooting them down right away. Yeah. Right. No, like I know there was one rumor that he came to the pro or came to, I guess the admin asking for NIL back in December. And they, you guys said that they didn't have anything and that's just not true. whatsoever. Well, all those guys wanted to contract at that point. And then as this mm-hmm. process went on, he asked, you know, to be fair to Pat Kraft and Anili Bendapudi, I mean, everything he asked mm-hmm. for, uh, they met every, they met every ask he made. And then when, in terms okay. of NIL asks that were made, not only did they meet it, they exceeded it in less than 48 hours. And again, I can't get into specifics, but it was not a situation. And I think that to, that's really a credit to the people that are running successful on on a day-to-day basis, but even more so it's a credit mm-hmm. to our fan base. And we really should have been focused on the fact that when the number, you know, when that number, which was more than four times what it had been previously, um, when that number was put out mm-hmm. there, that the fan base rallied and got it done. Um, so I think those kind of things are, are important for people to understand. And look, I think everybody needs to stop talking about the guy who left and needs to start talking about the guy who's here because, uh, you know, I think the back and forth that's going on right now. Um, there are people that say, you know, uh, that, you know, some of the things that are going on are, you know, the ongoing stories do not help the athletic department because I can tell you um, as a guy who coached for 22 years, the types of articles that are being written, ripping our, our NIL um, are not helpful because schools that recruit against us are going to put those in, in the recruits hands and they're not factually accurate. So, I mean, both of those things are damaging. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, kind of piggybacking off that, just any care care to any comment uh, about anything about the Brandon Short article or slash podcast interview? I didn't really see it all. Didn't really watch it. Didn't really register. So yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, is there a part of it? I don't know if there's any part of it you want to ask about. Um, no, it was just more so um, he was just saying that a couple of board members um, weren't all on board with NIL. Um, the other thing was, um, I guess it, it kind of, it didn't, it mentioned that multiple board members weren't on board with NIL and on board with helping football. And it didn't say who it was, but it kind of hinted towards you in a couple. Well, I can tell you, as far as not being on board with NIL, um, my first conversation about NIL was three years ago. Um, I talked Mm -hmm. to Sandy Barber about it. When the last vote came up, one of the issues I brought up is what were we going to do about NIL? And the administration's response was that um, NIL was not going to happen and that there were going to be laws passed in Congress. So there was kind of a head in the sand mentality. Um, and, you know, yeah. 15 months ago, there was there were no collectives operating. And, uh, you know, the for a guy who supposedly wasn't pushing or wasn't interested in NIL, you know, I'm one of the guys who put the thing together. And as it turned out, you know, I because I was a trustee on the advice of legal counsel at Penn State, I was able to help start it, mm-hmm. pr- promote it, and then I had to back away. So there is no, there is no, I've been trying to pull Penn State towards NIL long before anybody else. And the other thing I'm trying to get them to understand is revenue sharing is coming as well. Because again, I see what's yeah. going on nationally. I'm plugged into it. And it is, revenue sharing is coming. And we've got to be, start to get ready for that because it's going to be here in a year or two when the Johnson case gets out of federal court and gets to the C- Supreme Court. They're going to they're going to rule in favor of the athletes. So these are the things we haven't mm-hmm. been behind the times. We've been I've been one of the people pushing us to get forward. Yeah. So so now kind of again piggybacking off what you just said. How hard was it kind of for you and the trustees to adjust to the NIL world? And uh, I get uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Well, I the guess. trust the Sorry. NIL thing. You know, people try to make it a trustee issue. It's really not a trustee issue. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, I've had those conversations. You know, it it, it really started with. Like I said, three years ago, when California passed the law, I, you know, I basically said, mm-hmm. you guys got to understand this is going to happen. And one of the things that, that I advocated for was when the university felt like we should be pushing for a law on NIL to put kind of restrictions on it. Um, the NCA at that point had said, if you don't have a state law, you write your own rules. And I argued with some people and, you know, members of our athletic department lobbied uh, the state uh, legislator legislature to pass a law that which put some restrictions on it, which we then went back and asked them to to rescind. So, you know, I've been trying to get us on the forefront of this thing for a long time, despite what a lot of people are, are trying to say about me. You know, there it's funny because I have other people telling me I can't believe you you think we should be paying student athletes and you've been supporting NIL. I have other people saying you're not you're not pushing it and I've been pushing it from day one. 
Yeah, of course. Um, you, you also mentioned before that every football player uh, on scholarship has a contract. Um, have you met with some of the members of the football program with like Franklin directly and to kind of discuss that NIL issues um, or NIL? No, overall? because one of the things that we've wanted to do and because I'm a trustee <clears throat> and because collectives, th their role is kind of, can they be involved? Can they not be involved? Can the university be involved? Everybody's tried to keep it at a 30,000 foot level. That said, Football has a has a NIL guy, Dan Kabbalah. The people running Success with Honor meet with him regularly. They talk to him regularly, and that's the protocol that has been put in place. So anybody insinuating that we haven't met with football to try and do something about NIL, again, it's a mischaracterization of it, 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 and that's that's all you got to say about it. We, we have been meeting. I shouldn't say we. Success with Honor has been meeting on a regular basis to get the things done that they need to get done. And, you know, some of the videos, I mean, I don't know if anybody watched the punter Barney this fall. Some of the videos he did for Successful Honor were hilarious. I mean, the guy, is the, he's, he's yeah. got a gift, not just as a punter. I mean, yeah. like, this guy is really legitimately hilarious. Yeah, uh, yeah you never know. Maybe we'll see him in the NFL in yeah. a, a year or not even a, a year, a couple months. Young Spice Adams, perhaps. <laughs> there you go. Um, so kind of piggybacking off the football stuff, there, there was a story circulating, circulating about an incident involving the trustees following the Rose Bowl uh, celebration. Um, I just wanted to know if you can clear that up. I know there was rumors that you weren't, you and others weren't shaking hands with Franklin after the Rose Bowl, uh, win oh, and all that. I, I did not go to the Rose Bowl because my kids were all home. So, but yeah, the celebration when, afterwards. when, the, when they came to talk to the uh, board about the Rose Bowl, um, the meeting was about to start. I had been in the bathroom. I was coming in the back of the meeting room, and the chair of the board, Matt Schuyler, was asking everybody to get in their hand in their seats. James was standing in the back with four other players. As I went by him to the left, I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, "Hey, congrats!" And then I said, "Hey, are you, you know?" Because we had just done successful honor, just done the contracts. I said, "Did you guys get everything you need done for NIL?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, we're all good." And I went and sat down. Because of the time, it wasn't. There was no receiving line snub. It wasn't like after a game where coach is supposed to shake hand. I mean, quite frankly, the whole story is pretty mm -hmm. juvenile, if you ask me. But at the end of the day, yeah. it's it's absolutely it's it's not true. Well, rumors no. are fun, right? Believe me. So I'm sure you hear plenty yeah. of them. Um, the other thing, um, I guess you're up for yep. every election yep. this year, correct? Um, anything you kind of want to, that, yeah. that was my last question. I'm kind of out of stuff. Um, anything you kind of want to pitch a little bit and Well, I talk think about the important that? thing that we've got to look at is when you look at a trustee election, while football is something everybody's passionate about, you know, when you look at, when you look at football and athletics, it represents less around 2% of the total budget of an $8.4 billion budget at Penn state. Yeah. Uh, if you look at athletics in terms of 850 athletes, System-wide, we have 88,000 students. So 99% of our students are not involved in athletics. So this election has got to be about way more than just one NIL or football or whatever it may be. We've got, we've got families that are legitimately struggling to pay tuition. We've got students that are dealing with mental health issues, food insecurity issues, housing insecurity. We've got all kinds of things that we should be doing. And, you know, one of the things I've tried to be all along is be a, you know, a fiscal, fiscal, fiscally conservative because we are dealing with other with other people's money, so to speak, tuition dollars, things like that. So one of the things I've been criticized a bunch is about voting against the lash billing two years ago. Now, to be clear, mm -hmm. that money was approved. I did vote against it, but the, the lash billing renovations have been have been completed. So there was nobody withheld any money. The reasons I voted against the last billing at that time was the first question we asked, what is the maintenance backlog on Beaver Stadium? Okay, that means the deferred maintenance, how bad is it? How much do we have it? The administration did not tell us. They said, we don't know. We asked about the NIL, no, no response. We asked about what was going to happen that fall with COVID because we had just come off the COVID year and they didn't know. So there were all these unknowns. And I felt like we should be putting money towards the stadium first, or at least have a better footing as to, before we borrowed forty-eight million dollars for a weight room. Now, just to just to show that I'm consistent, when the eighty-four million dollar art museum loan came up, I voted against that. Eric Barron was trying to build a fourteen million dollar private el elevator and a suite renovation at Beaver Stadium, and we basically we, we killed that because we basically said that fourteen million dollars. 
That represents $14 million as a 1% tuition increase on in-state students. $14 million, if we're going to throw $14 million in the stadium, I felt like maybe some bathrooms for the paying ticket holders. And, and we've got to do – and we're yeah. going to have challenges in the future, and we've got to do it in a way that we don't want to double ticket prices on people who, for whom this is their disposable income. But the most important thing is that we are, we are doing the things fiscally we should be doing. Um, that we, because we're, the university right now is talking about budget cuts, they're talking about layoffs, they're talking about a lot of, of reductions and things that we've got to get through as a university. Um, and, you know, yes, I was in the board of trustees when those things happened, but when Eric Barron's contract came up, I was very uncomfortable with the direction of where we were going. And I was one of only four trustees that voted against it. Um, some of the people that are being very critical of me voted for his contract extension. So, um, I think people, I hope people will look at the big picture. Penn State has always been about the big picture. Um, football success has never come at the expense of academic success here uh, and has never tarnished the reputation or academic side. And that's, and it's not going to, I mean, that we're just, we're, that's the way we run things. But I think people have to focus on the issues that really, really or take up the predominant amount of our time. I mean, even you look at our health system, our health system, you know, athletics is about $200 million a year. Our health system is in the neighborhood of $4 billion. Our research is a $1 billion a year. So we've got a lot of things that we have to take care of beyond just football. And if anybody wants to just make it one yeah. issue, then I think their, their, deci their decision-making uh, probably is missing the big picture. So, so you piqued my interest with the renovation mm -hmm. stuff before. Um, I, I don't mean to change the subject completely, but uh, did, can, you, can you talk more about that and talk more about what's what's the future look like for Beaver Stadium? I know Pat Kraft has hinted at a couple things maybe coming. Yeah, I, th soon. I think we're on, a, we're on a track to, you know, he's made it clear, and I believe Neely Bendapudi's made it clear that they're talking about renovation. Um, I would, you know, I think mm -hmm. that will have broad, broad support on this board. Um, I think a couple things we've got to, we got to, you know, I've made the argument with people that I'm a Red Sox fan, Yankee fan, don't hate me for that, but 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 I but I but I will say this: yeah, okay. the one thing about the Red Sox have done well is they've taken the footprint of Fenway, they've added things and amenities to increase revenue because we're going to have to increase revenue that we get out of the stadium without jacking the ticket mm -hmm. prices on everybody, because we've got to keep the people that have been around for ten and twenty and thirty years with season ticket holders. So if we can keep that footprint, make those kind of amenities, and add those things to the stadium so that we can keep that same location and the same idea that it's a college stadium and not a carnival. Um, when you look at what the Yankees did with, with the Yankee Stadium, they built an entirely new Yankee Stadium. And I I like, I really love the old Yankee Stadium. And it's weird when I went to a game there the first time, it's not the home plate that Joe DiMaggio or Reggie Jackson or people like that play that. And I think, I think the good thing is we have an administration that understands it. And I also think they understand that um, Building building an entirely new stadium is cost prohibitive because now you're talking about you're in the above a billion dollars in, in in construction and for less seats. And I would hate to tell ten or fifteen or twenty thousand of our fans, hey, you've been great for us for all these years, but unless you jack your contribution up, you're not relevant to us anymore. And I, and I think everybody is on board with that one in terms of whether it's James Franklin or whether it's Pat Kraft or anybody, I think we all feel that, you know, we, we sell those tickets. So why would we tell people not to come and, or we, you're not want to be here. So I think the renovation, that thing, there's more to come, but I think uh, people will be very happy that we're going to be able to maintain the character of what makes this place so unique. Now, now can you give me some examples of those amenities? I know obviously they just added, uh, Beer and liquor, or just beer yeah. sales, and they, that didn't. That was not totally unanimous, as you know. <laughs> um, I, but I, I think yeah. some of the things. The, hey, I'm I, all I for think beer. one of the things I think you'll see is, <laughs> you know, when you know, if you look at the the, the press box side, um, in 2011, mm -hmm. um, that the the other side, the new deck and everything had been paid off. So we were in the process then of okay, mm -hmm. we're going to go and work on the press box side, renovate it, probably add sky box suites over there. Um, and one of the things that, that I think it's important for people to know in terms of our sports marketplace, if you go to, you go to the University of Alabama, for, for, for instance, in the state of Alabama, the most mm -hmm. valuable piece of sports real estate is a suite at an Alabama football game because they don't have NFL, they don't have all those other things. We're competing with Steelers, Eagles, I'm going to forget somebody, Penguins, Flyers, 
pirates. You know, you get, you know, mm -hmm. you get the idea. Seventy six, all kind of stuff. So the companies yeah. that are in those cities are going to put their really big money into those amenities, into those suites before they come here because they're right there. They're not dealing with hotel rooms. They're not dealing with travel. All those kind of things. So we have to be very mm -hmm. creative in the way we cr enhance our revenue. We're going to have to be very creative in a way that we don't go out and ask fans that have been here for a long, long time to say, OK, you know what? You've been great and loyal, whatever. We're going to double your ticket prices because that's because you're going to lose them. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. do not have a corporate uh, fan base and ticket base. We have families and we have people that are taking their grandkids and their kids and, and generations, generations. And I've seen it for decades. Yeah, not, not just football, but what's the next step for Penn State overall? What do they have to do to make that next? You mean leap? overall the athletic department, or uh, I thought hey, let's, let's start with the athletic department, then we could talk. University well, I, I think right now Pat Kraft is doing a great job. Um, he and I have had a lot of conversations. I, you know, when the basketball thing was going on, I texted him. I said, "Look, I don't want to know. I don't need to know. You handle. You know, if you need something, let me." Because look, you know, he he's 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 really talented. And he's got a great feel for this place. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do as a trustee is let them do their jobs. You know, don't be. So I think I think we're in a great place. I think there's going to be some things that, you know, obviously the stadium is going to really dictate the types of revenue we're able to generate in the future that are going to the TV revenue is going to be something. I think the revenue sharing as it yeah. relates to uh, as it relates to athletes is coming. So we have to be able to, to get through that. It's going to be a very challenging time. And. And the NCA is, you know, for them to think Congress is going to come in and swoop in and save the day. I don't know what Congress they've been watching lately, but I mean, I don't, I don't want to hold my breath waiting for them. And I don't mean to be flippant, yeah. but I mean, you know, the reality is the NCA. We should figure out these things. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at for Penn State generally, um, the challenge for us is going to be we have some very difficult fiscal challenges uh, right now. I think we have the right leadership. Doc Neely Bendapudi has been great. She has a chief of staff, Michael Wade Smith, who's mm -hmm. just really an incredible human being and very talented people. Um, but I think we're going to have to, you know, everybody at this university is going to make some hard choices. We're going to have to deal. We're going to pull up our belts and, and and go out and do some things that maybe we don't want to do in the short term in terms of uh, fiscally. But I think overall, the Penn State Penn State alumni will rally. I think Penn, you know, I, I, you know, just this past fall, um, my mom had a dinner at her house, bringing, and and mm -hmm. it was the night before the Ohio State game, and we reached out. I, I was one of the people. I, I gave her the idea. I called some people, and we got some uh, alums who had not been on campus in a decade um, to kind of get over mm -hmm. that whole thing and get back in on, on board. And they came into town. The dinner Neely was at that dinner. Pat Kraft was at that dinner. And, and there were athletics donors, there were academics donors, and we, you know, we we all, we are all rowing the boat in the same direction. We are all pushing the same, you know, they're, they're the much. Oh, be, oh yeah, you're right. That's sorry. Like that's, that's, we're, <laughs> let me put it this way. As, as a guy, the coach said, look, we're all trying to rob the same train. Um, so, so we're all heading the same Man, direction. Uh, and, and, you know, mm -hmm. anybody trying to say any otherwise just isn't paying attention. I mean, Neely has been. You know, Neely's been a breath of fresh air. And and look, we've wanted to be do, be, to have this approach for a number of years. For whatever reason, the previous administration, there was some resistance to it. And, that, and that's fine. They have their reasons, and I'm not going to criticize whatever they were. But we're in a new place right now, a new time. Mm -hmm. And I think people should be very, very excited about what's going to happen in football, what's going to happen in basketball, what's going to happen across all of our sports, because we've got great coaches across the board. And certainly, most importantly, what's mm -hmm. going to happen at this university? I mean, the things that we're doing and some of the construction projects in this campus that we're investing in the things that this country needs, engineers, uh, AI, all kinds of stuff like that, um, sustainable, sustainable energy, those kind of things. It's going to be a great mm – -hmm. we're, we're about to head into a great era for Penn State after we get some things in order. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, you, you talked about the TV deal and the revenue deals. Um, the big part of that is obviously USC and UCLA coming in. What are just your overall thoughts to that? Because you yeah. obviously grew up watching the Big Ten, and it was a totally different conference. Yeah, and I'm so old. I grew up before that we were in the Big Ten. That's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah, um, but no, no. You I, said I, it. I, I readily admit it. You know, my <laughs> somebody said you're middle aged. I said I'm. I'm in my fifties. I mean, you're optimistic. If this is the middle, um, then you're very optimistic. No, I. I think <laughs> the best thing that could happen for college athletics, quite frankly is for there to be national television deals like the NFL. 
Because once you do that and the rev now, now certainly for the Big Ten, the SEC, you'd have to give up some money. And that, you know, that may not be best for the SEC and the Big Ten. But if you said to me, what's the best thing that happened for college football would be a national television deal. And then USC and UCLA can go back where they belong because it's going to be football is one thing. We'll go out there every other year, probably. Whereas USC and UCLA are going to be playing four or five games, two time zones away or more, which NFL teams don't really even do. Um, and then when you look at that, but, but let's take it down the line a little bit. Think about their basketball teams. How many times are you going to have to come East? Think about their baseball teams. I mean, the women's lacrosse team at USC, I think, yeah, they do have a women's lacrosse team. Their nearest conference opponents could be Northwestern. I mean, cause UCLA doesn't have a team. So, I mean, you're looking at, you know, yeah. for at least last I checked, um, you said it's never a women's cross team, but there, there are sports like that. I mean, our volleyball team, women's volleyball teams will go out there once and play USC and UCLA. Their volleyball teams will be coming out here five, six times. So um, no one has really broken that down as what that's going to mean. Ideally, if we could get national revenue and create a national kind of football uh, organization, then we can get back to those things. And, you know, maybe, maybe you know, some of these rivalries that we've had over the years, you know, a pit game can come back. Um, you know, Nebraska, Oklahoma can come back, you know, those kind of things. Um, but we'll see. I mean, that's, but I think, I think USC and UCLA is going to be exciting. Um, uh, especially after we beat them a bunch of times and it'll be great for, we got, we got a lot of alums in California <laughs> to be excited to see us out there. So that part's fun, but you know, you know, we'll see how it goes. I'm glad you mentioned the pit thing. Cause I wanted to ask you about that too. Um, it's been some time since the two programs have played. What are your thoughts on a potential series coming back in the future? And do, and do you think that series will come I back? I think with nine conference games, it becomes very, very tough to do. I think one of the things the SEC and the ACC have mm -hmm. done a great job of is they're, you know, they're, they're, they're playing those eight conference games and they're allowing for Georgia, Georgia Tech last week. They're allowing for Louisville and Kentucky. They're allowing Florida, Florida State, South Carolina, Clemson. So you have those games at the end of the year, which are real exciting. And I would love to see us play eight Big Ten games. But now that we've added two more teams, that's not going to happen. But ideally, if you could do that, you could play Pitt at the end of the year every year, which, you know, th the great thing is the proximity and the dislike. The stadium would be full because, you know, sometimes we play Michigan State here that weekend or Rutgers that weekend. You know, there isn't the same. And that's not to be critical of those. It's just their fans don't travel in necessarily. And our fans don't necessarily go out to East Lansing or wherever it may be. Um, it would be ideal if we could get something like that at the end of the year. Um, and then, you know, still have an ability to play someone else, like, a, you know, play a play a, like an Auburn game or an Alabama game or Florida or somebody like that, because that's another thing we have to do to enhance revenue. You're going to have to play some games like that because in your non-conference games, you keep all that revenue. So if we play uh, Delaware or UMass like we're going to do this year, you need some of those home games. But when you don't sell it out, that's all revenue you don't share with the Big Ten. And so you're missing some revenue opportunities there. So th there's a lot of things that, that are going to, you know, but, you know, I'm going to leave that to Pat Kraft because that's his job. And I'm going to leave that to James Franklin, the people in football, to decide those things as to whether we play Pitt or not. I'd love to I'd love to see us play Pitt, and I'd love to go to Beaver Stadium and have a Coca-Cola. But, you know, not up to me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um so talking football, you mentioned Drew Allard before. You mentioned James Franklin. What, what are your expectations for the season? I think we all kind of have the same. The um, as part. the guy who's coached, uh, you know, the one thing I'm excited because I think there's a lot of great young talent. There's no question about it. Um, this is a really exciting, going to be a really exciting mm -hmm. team to watch. Um, I suspect Drew Allard will have a great, great season. However, you know, a friend of mine who used to raise hunting dogs used to tell me, you know, you can give all the – you can get all the genetics you want. You can have all the lineage you want at that great dog. And when you go out the first time and shoot the gun, yeah. they may go chase the rabbit or chase the bird, or they may be hiding behind your leg. Uh, like, whoa, what was this? Because it's a whole nother mm -hmm. level once you get into games. Now, Drew, Drew has played in some games, and including sometimes, I think, Purdue mm -hmm. and one or two, maybe have another game or two where he came in when the game was in doubt and handled himself pretty well. So, I, you know, I would suspect he's going to do really, really well. Uh, I know, you know, having coach Daryl Clark, who was from Ohio, who was first team all Big Ten two years in a row, knowing John Schaefer, Capital, or uh, uh, Blackledge, um, and, you know, even Sean Clifford. We've had some pretty dang good quarterbacks that come out of the state of Ohio. So I expect him to have a great year. Uh, I think the running backs are really talented. Uh, I know a lot of people talk about Nick Singleton, mm -hmm. but, you know, 
they're all good. You know, it's going to be really, really fun yeah. to watch these guys play. <laughs> Um, you know, there's some really good talent. I think obviously secondary, they're going to, have to do some work, but they, but again, there's more young talent. That's a good thing is they've got the depth, but experience is, is something that, you know, really, really helps, uh, in, in some tough games. And, and, you know, they don't start out, you know, you start out right off the bat with West Virginia, uh, Iowa's early in the season, they go to Columbus. So, you know, we're, we're going to know how, you know, it's, yeah. it's going to be a lot of fun. So, so I mean, any prediction? Any not yet. Not certainly like not till spring practice is over. And I mean, you, especially <laughs> okay. now, you know, when you Fair look now, guys can transfer. And dunk, you know, like, you know, what's going to happen? Or does somebody, <laughs> yeah. you know, somebody get hurt? And, you know, like people that are prognosticating and ranking teams mm-hmm. right now, it's like, if you're that confident, go put your house up on that. I mean, because, you know, because I'll take that. You know, I'll take yeah. most of those bets. I mean, because you look at a year ago, nobody expected yeah. Penn State to do anything. And, you know, I remember saying to mm-hmm. a friend of mine, I said, you know, you, you can't put a price tag on the kind of leadership you have at quarterback. I mean, a guy that's been through the ringer, um, you know, those guys, that, that's valuable. And, and, you know, so we'll see. Yeah, I say it all the time about Sean. Uh, there, as much hate as he's gotten from the fan base, he's been incredibly – he's been an incredible player oh, overall. Sure. He's just been – I know everyone wants to say he was like, hey, he has downfalls, but oh, when he's up, no, he's up. And no, no he, doubt. He went and, up and on a high note. At the end of the day, I mean, I know there was a lot of people saying we should be playing Drew last year. And, you know, I do a TV show, Nittany Game Week, and we got questions from fans. I said, look, if mm-hmm. we could, you know, the obligation last year was to the guys who were on that team then to have the best possible season they could have. And if the coaches believed that Drew Allar would give them the best chance to win, they would have played him. And that's not that's not any discredit yeah. to Drew Allen. The point is, is they felt like Sean Clifford gave him the the best chance to win. And you know what? By and large, he did. I mean, you know, yeah, people talk about Ohio State and Michigan. But you know what? At the end of the day, those are two really, really good football teams. And and if Harrison doesn't get hurt against Georgia, Ohio State probably wins that, and they probably win the whole thing. So it's not like you're losing the slouch teams, okay? So, I mean, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody. Yeah. But it gives people something to talk about. Yeah. So the last thing I got for you, new basketball coach. We touched on it a little bit here and there. What are your overall thoughts on Mike Rhodes? I have PA not, guy, I have not uh, met him like, yet. Um, I, uh, I know, I know that uh, okay. people, in, you, you know, I've, I have, uh, um, I have two kids that play lacrosse up at St. Bonaventure University and they're in the A-10. And I know talking to people up mm-hmm. there, you know, they're glad he's out of the league. <laughs> Quite frankly, they're like, good, good riddance. <laughs> you guys take him, pay for him, get him the heck out of there, whatever. But, I mean, in terms of you look at the types of people mm-hmm. who have spoken out and, and the kind of respect he commands, um, I'm really excited about where we are. And I hope everybody will get, will get excited about it, just like we were excited two years about two years ago when Michael Shrewsbury came on board. Um, I think there can be some great days ahead of us. And, and you know what? I think, you know, this is a guy who has made it very, very clear, based on the contract he signed, that he wants to be here for a long time. And, uh, and that's what you want. You, want, mm-hmm. you know, I, I want someone who wants to be here. Uh, more than anything else, and that's good. I'm, and I'm excited to see what we can do. Because look, I'm a guy who grew up in Rec Hall right. and saw some really bad basketball. I'm a guy who, uh, you know, at age 13, was listening to the radio in December of 1981 when Penn State was up 10 on North Carolina, and that team had Worthy, Perkins, Doherty, and this freshman. Um, what was his name? Oh, Michael Jordan. And we were up 10 and lost them in overtime. And it was at the Cable Car Classic out in California. Yeah. And I went to bed heartbroken. And of course, of course, we didn't know who Michael Jordan was yeah. at that time like we do now. But I mean, you know, I've, I've been, I, I mm-hmm. love basketball. I've wanted to succeed forever. And I'm happy to tell you where we're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well. Yeah, it seems like uh, they have a good shot of succeeding on their uh, under roads. Yeah. He's got a lot to do, obviously. Yeah. There's only three scholarship players currently. That's that's a yeah, well, that's task a in its own. Thing. And, and that's but, another uh, thing that hopefully the NCAA can kind of get their head around and hands around and try. To, and, I, and I think as mm-hmm. if you get to revenue sharing, because uh, look, NIL is not going to mm-hmm. go away. But when revenue sharing comes, now you have the ability yeah. to at least come to a written agreement like I'll be here for two years or whatever it may be. So I, I think that'll settle it down some. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Big Ten revenue is one of yeah. the, if not the best right now. So, no doubt. I mean, that should definitely no help as well. But, uh, but before I sign off, um, Jay, anything else you want to you plug? Anything like that? Um, uh, well, the only thing else you want to talk this about? This week, and it's Thursday, so it's the 13th of April. We've got a thing called the Impact Awards, which we're going to – what this was really created okay. is to recognize 
Penn State is really the world's leading service-oriented university. And what we wanted to do is create an mm -hmm. award that honors the st our student athlete alumni and their impact on the world. And we run on, we're honoring Michael Robinson, we're honoring Aaron May, but we're honoring a guy named Bill Spore, who have created foundations to educate young people in Mike in Richmond, Virginia, Aaron Maven in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, Bill Spore is building schools in Uganda. So we, we're talking about all over the world. Hmm. And next year, it'll go to where we are looking at athletes from all 31 sports, alumni athletes. We're even gonna, we're going to recognize seven current okay. Penn State athletes um, for what they're doing as well. So it's going to be a great event, but it's sold out, but it's going to be televised. And if you go to PennStatersMakeAnImpact.com, you can find out where it's going to be on and where it's going to stream. Um, and then, you know, also we're going to encourage Penn Staters to submit things they're doing to impact their communities. And we're going to have a gallery of those kind of things because we really want the world to understand that Penn State is different. Uh, we always have been. We always will be. We're unique. So that's really that's really kind of the, the thing that's been really taking up most of my time uh, lately. And, you know, between, you know, you know, we did a Thon TV show that won the time frame in New York City and mm -hmm. Philly and helped raise a bunch of money. Done success. I mean, all these things are, are are part of what I do, and these are all things I'm doing because I love Penn State. I don't get a dime from any of them, and I'm not interested in getting a dime from. Them. I'm doing it because yeah. Penn State is a place that we all love, and I I hope people understand that. Yeah, awesome. Um, so stay tuned for that. We'll put the link in the bio and the description below. Um, that's that's another episode of the Penn State 365 podcast. Signing off. <laughs>